Alrighty, welcome back my friends um, to lecture video number two um, for our final set of videos for the semester. Then you don't have to worry about me anymore. Yay! <laughs> um, so uh, initially uh, the first video looked at an introduction of the benthic environment and um, some of the the creatures that live around there, right, um, including the suspension feeders. So what I want to focus on now are some of the, the animals that live um, on the rocky shorelines. So the reason that I focus on this um, in this class is because we live like where there's tons of rocky shorelines, right? You go up and down California um, and you go along uh, the coastlines, you need to go tide pooling, you'll be able to see um, varieties of these creatures. So you know, because it's relevant, I feel like it would be kind of a fun thing um, to focus on. So, um, so for organisms of the rocky shore, there's tons and tons and tons of different kind, which I think is really fascinating. Um, it's a very rich and complex community in a region of major environmental extremes. So if you are something that lives up here, um, in the top part of the water, or top part of the water, top part of the rocks, then you have to handle, you have to be adapted to live out of the water for long periods of time, right? Remember that tides, when they go in and out, that's like a 12 to 24 hour period, yeah? So these animals would have to be out of the water for that long. But if you are uh, in the bottom here, then you have to deal with being out of the water, or excuse me, in the water, um, but you have to deal with space and predators, a little bit more so than the, than the ones being out of the water. So it's kind of like a mixed bag um, in a way, which I think is, is really fascinating. Um, so the distribution of these organisms relies on their ability to cope with this stress um, and removing one element from the ecosystem then another one can dominate. Uh, if we recall back once again to the urchin, kelp, and sea otter uh, situation, if we take the sea otters out of the mix, then there's going to be too much urchin and it's going to eat all the kelp. Um, and uh, yeah, so that can be uh, just a, a not a great thing there. So some of the examples um, on this sketched diagram here include uh, lichens and algae. Uh, periwinkle snails, kind of where the, the high tide would come up to. You got rock crabs and barnacles and limpets and snails um, and some other different types of, um, of seaweed and blue mussels, chitons, oyster drills. Um, and then underneath all of that, we have um, the, the um, other creatures as well. So we got sea urchin, leather stars, sea anemones, and different types of seaweed which is, is really interesting, and oysters as well. Love oysters. Um, so I want to kind of go into some of the uh, organisms in particular, starting with the upper zone here. And I'm super mature, and I don't laugh at this every single time, but these are in the super littoral zone. Um, and this is the, the area that's above water um, of normal high tide. And remember that we have tide extremes too. So even though for the most part, they're probably out of the water, they may, like during king tide, may actually be underwater at points as well. So they have to really be adapted to, to all of these um, conditions. So algae and, and lichen, or lichen, however you say, however you say that, um, appear as crusts on rocks and are generally pretty indis indistinguishable from the rock itself. And I highly encourage you to look at look for these next time you go to the tide pools, especially if you go during like kind of still kind of high tide. You're if you're walking around the rocks and you're walking around the super littoral zone and you'll be able to see these creatures. Um, they look really weird too, like some of them anyway. Um, so limpets, these little these little buddies here, and this snail. Um, these are or sorry, this snail here, this little periwinkle. Uh, these are little herbivores, and remember, herbivores are um, plant eaters. And um, we have our barnacles here. Barnacles basically like attach to anything. <laughs> um, they attach to to whales, to sand dollars, to rocks. I mean, they're freaking everywhere, um, which is is really kind of interesting. And they feed on the particulate matter um, in the water. 
whereas our little rock louse here, this is a scavenger. Um, as you know, I've been uh, obsessed with that show alone. And in one of the seasons where they're up, I think, in Canada, um, they're often up in the, or when they're fishing, if they're not being able to catch fish, they, like, pop these little bad boys off and make, like, limpets, too, <laughs> which is weird. But they literally look like rocks on rocks. So maybe you didn't even know that that was a creature before, and now you do. The more you know. <laughs> um... Now we're going to continue our journey down the rocky shore space into the middle littoral zone. And here, creatures have to be have to deal with being in crowded spaces, and um, they're super in the competition extreme as well. Um, and predators can eat some of the occupants in order to clear space. Rude. <laughs> um, but storms and large logs can also clear out an area pretty efficiently. Um, remember that like, uh, coral reefs do a really good job of protecting an area from wave action. Um, if there's not that protection or if there's a big storm that comes through, then like big pieces of debris can come and knock off these animals. So like blue mussels, for example, they have to be incredibly attached to the, to the rocks so that hopefully a big storm doesn't and waves don't like take them off. Um. Similarly for like anemones, um, anemones are actually mobile, which is kind of wild. Um, oftentimes crabs will um, put them on either side or snails to like help them for defense, which is kind of funny, I think. Um, so here we also have some sea worms, oops, um, and oops, uh, shore crabs. There's tons and tons of shore crabs if you go to um, Half Moon Bay to the Pillar Point, um, what's it called? tide pools. You got to look in the, in the rocks though. You got to, you got to find them. Um, also shore crabs will often bury themselves underneath the sand. And you know, like when water recedes, um, sometimes you'll see like these little air bubbles pop up. Guess what? There's some crabs hanging out under, uh, under that sand. So pretty crazy, pretty wild. Um, next up, we are now in the lower littoral zone, which has a massive variety of organisms. Um, some can be cemented into the sediment or the rocks, while others can walk or swim around. Um, and again, I highly encourage you to look, look for these next time you go to the tide pools. Um, if you go to Pillar Point, you'll see so many green anemone. They are freaking everywhere. Um... If they're in the water, they will oftentimes will be opened up. If they're out of the water, they will be closed in, and they kind of look like booty holes. I mean, honestly, they, 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 they look really weird when they are all closed up. Um, I encourage you to not touch them. They are they're supposed to, you know, not have human bacteria hands on them. Um, some other ones uh, include octopus. So we have a great Pacific octopus around here. Uh, beautiful orange color. The Monterey Bay Aquarium has two of them, I believe. Um, what else? We have some sea squirts and like some sea sponges. We have some nudie branches, which are also known as sea slugs. Um, some different anemones here as well. Um, a ribbon worm. Let's see. Brittle stars, kelp crabs, abalone. Abalone is um, fished for quite often in our waters, which is pretty cool. Um, sea urchins, scallops, um, purple sea stars, tons of these, again, at Pillar Point and the orange ones as well, and different um, sea cucumbers and other types of sea stars. So really, really fascinating creatures all have different, you know, aspects to them that make them unique and beautiful. Um, and I just think that that's the, the coolest thing since sliced bread. Um, okay, next up, I want to chit chat about coral reefs. So coral reefs are incredibly diverse and very rich communities. Um, they provide habitats for tens of thousands of fish and other organisms. For most coral reefs, like the ones that we think about, like maybe when you think about tropical water, they require warm, clear, shallow, clean water in order to, uh, and firm substrate to attach to. So they have to have something to pop onto. They don't just kind of like float in the in the water and call it a day. They actually need something um, to to cling on to in order to grow. Uh, and oftentimes people will uh, like 
intentionally sink stuff like statues or uh, boats or planes or whatever in order to kind of act as an artificial reef and hopefully be that hardness that coral need to survive on. Um, and tropical coral, their optimal temperature is between 18 and 25 degrees Celsius. And so because of that, they are restricted to the regions of 30 degrees north and south. So basically the equatorial tropical areas. Um, that's the reason why we don't have coral reefs over here. Um, even in Hawaii, which is at about, I think, 20-ish degrees north, um, because the water is relatively cool there, the coral actually grows relatively slowly in comparison to, say, the coral in the Great Barrier Reef or coral reefs like in the, the tropical islands of like Fiji or Bora Bora or whatever. So that's kind of an inter interesting thing there. And then last little thing, or several things, I suppose, about coral reefs. Um, this is just a picture of, I think, someone's, this looks like someone's coral tank. Um, but what's fascinating with coral is they actually consist of two creatures, um, polyps, which are the animal part, and uh, zooanthale, which are the plant part. So zooanthale and polyps, they exist in this really beautiful symbiotic relationship um, where they both have to be there in order for the coral to live, thrive, and survive in the tropical coral reefs, right? So polyps will kind of emerge at night and they almost look like um, miniature sea anemones where they have like the similar little like little thingies and they kind of capture whatever what's ever in the water because they're a filter feeder. And then the zooanthale, the plant part of it, photosynthesizes. And so with that photosynthesis, it generates about 60% of the coral reef's food. So the, the coral heavily relies on the zooanthale, right? Unfortunately, bleaching occurs when the water gets too warm and the zooanthale do adduces and they leave. So the zooanthale, by the way, are also the colorful part of the coral that we envision when we think of a pretty coral reef. So if you don't have the zooanthale, you don't have the photosynthesis, you don't have the color, thus we are left with a stark white coral. Um, and if the zooanthale does not return, then the coral will completely bleach out and die. We talked about that when we talked about um, climate change impacts pretty heavily. And other things like human activities, like walking on coral, um, and because, you know, divers are really respectful of the, huh, of the area, obviously, um, but they can accidentally, accidentally like step on the coral, which can damage them. Um, but also there, um, there's something like reef safe sunscreen. If you go to Hawaii, you can only buy reef safe sunscreen. That's the only stuff that they sell, but basically like the chemicals in the sunscreen do damage to the coral. It like hurts the animal. It hurts the plant. It really just horrifies and like, it does not do well for the environment. Um, so if you can try and try and find, uh, reef safe sunscreen, which is just a, a little thing there. Um, and then let's see, what else did I want to say about that? Um, uh, no, 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 no. I think that's about, yeah, that's about it in terms of tropical coral reefs. There is also deep water coral that are out there. They actually don't, um, they don't have the zooanthale, so they, they grow much, much, much slower than our tropical reef friends. All right. So when we come back, we will talk about uh, critters on the deep sea floor and finish up with uh, symbiosis. And then that, that's it, dear friends. All right. Thanks so much for watching.